plenty of folks here for quorum, so we'll get going. Um, so um, welcome everybody to the Monday, June 7th, hot and humid town council, <laughs> Cape Elizabeth town council workshop. Um, we have a few items on the agenda today. Is there anybody joining us from the public? Uh, I know there's a few folks that are gonna be part of various presentations, but anybody joining um, that's out there in the public that wants to um, speak about any of the items we have on our agenda today, if you'd like to do so, raise your hand uh, in the Zoom meeting and we'll call on you and open up your mic. And I see Ed Ree or Ray, Ed Ree. He's got his hand raised, so Matt will open up your mic, Ed, and um, go right ahead. If you could give your name and address, please. Uh oh, we've got a bad connection. Hi, Ed, or whomever is there. We've got we've got a bad connection. Maybe you can try reconnecting to the meeting if you can hear me. We're not hearing. We're not hearing your audio. It's all scrambled. So maybe, maybe disconnect from the meeting and and jump back in, and we'll get you up for your comment. Let's see if it's working any better. Sorry about that. Um, while we wait for that person to reconnect, was there anybody else that wanted to speak on any of the items? Hey, Mr. Chairman, Tim okay. and uh, Jason are here as, uh, as library uh, yep. committee members. So why don't we promote them up? And that's our first agenda item is, uh, or no, I'm sorry, we've got the finance item first. Um, and Ed made so it we'll, back as well. Okay, so let's, um, let's see if we can get Ed reconnected here. So uh, is that audio any better? Much better. Crystal clear. Thank you. That's way better. Good. Can we just get your name and address, please, Ed? Sure. It's uh, Ed Ray, Seven Glows Way. Thank you. Go right ahead. Um, I'm speaking on the shortcut roads question. Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, or emphasize that the, the association, the Cottage Brook Association has two um, interests in mind here. One is the public safety interest, um, um, any delay that might be incurred if an if a ambulance or fire engine were coming in from the, uh, from the other side of the shortcut. Um, obviously, we're, we're not interested in that. Um, and the second issue is, is um, it's our understanding it's, it's town road. Um, I know there's, there's a long history on this, or at least back to 2006, I guess. Uh, however, it seems like uh, it seems like it's town road. There ought to be the access. The, it was put in um, for access, and there ought to be the access. We understand. Uh, we understand the concerns of the neighbors about traffic that it might be generated. Um, I, I guess we feel that, that those concerns are overstated and it, of course it cuts both ways. Uh, people from that neighborhood could certainly come down uh, the Astor Lane, which is the main thoroughfare through, uh, through our development, um, gives easy access to uh, Spur link and 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 such, so we could see it working both ways. Um, I just wanted to bring up those issues. Those are things that are of concern to um, the uh, Cottage Brook residents. Thanks, Ed. Um, so we've got that third on our agenda. We'll appreciate your comments, and um, if we have questions or want to hear more when we get to that agenda item, we'll we'll certainly. Um, uh, revisit that as well. So, okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, without any other public comment, let's move to the first agenda item, 
which is um, revisiting the recommended amendments to the purchasing policy and establishing a policy to ensure that certain policies are reviewed on a regular basis. And John Corderaro is with us. And John, do you wanna tee this up? Sure. Uh, Thanks. It, in your packet, there, should, there are two memos. One is that has to do with purchasing policy. And the second one has to do with what I refer to as a policy on policies. Uh, if you start with the purchasing policy, there are six um, changes that I made based upon the conversation that we had on May 5th. And the last item there has to do with the value of purchases that would have to be approved by the town council. Uh, concern was raised because the existing policy says 0.05% uh, of the last state value. And what I provided you was a review based upon last state value, uh, April 1 of 2019 and April 1 of 2020. Uh, those, that, those values are exceedingly high. They're well over a million dollars uh, that would be available for administrative approval um, and would have to pierce those figures before the council. So what I did was provide you with some uh, suggestions. The choice obviously is yours at 25,000, 50,000, 100,000 and 250,000. And I also provided you with the comparison of those numbers versus uh, the state value and what that percentage would be. Um, my recommendation would be, uh, given that the way it's currently written, you're at uh, over a million dollars before the council has an opportunity to weigh in, um, that if that figure were put in as an absolute number, at either 100 or 250,000, that would assure that the council has a good opportunity to participate in these purchasing decisions rather than the, the value being so high that you have no opportunity to participate in the conversation. Okay. Um, thanks, John, for laying that out for us. Matt, did you have anything you wanted to add on that before we get into the discussion? Yeah, interestingly enough, I, th I think this part of this was a function of when uh, when the policy was originally crafted versus uh, what our state valuation has evolved into. Uh, whereas I don't think the intent was ever to get in excess of a million dollars, specifically with the charter having a requirement that anything in excess of a million dollars needs to go out to referendum. So I think this is a great opportunity to revise uh, revise that amount and and it's a great uh, update of the policy uh, the one thing I would think is uh, uh, yeah I mean a lot of that gets approved um, the one thing I would I would think about would be setting that level as to where you might be comfortable with uh, uh, where uh, where vendors may come in and try to uh, uh, influence the process uh, just as a thought we we do well to seal bids so what we our, our process going forward would be, would be to bring the apparent low bidder and a recommendation to council uh, for action at, at a future event when there is such a purchase to be uh, to be uh, performed. For instance, in this year where the engine two's replacement would be a prime example of that. Uh, the one, uh, the other area I would have my experience in the past, we had a loader in gray that uh, we purchased and I, we had a gentleman who didn't appreciate where the recommendation from staff was and tried to come with an appeal to the council to have them overturn the staff recommendation and, and buy his unit, which was uh, about $5,000 less, but it was a far inferior uh, product in, according to what the staff's needs were. So uh, that's one of the best, what, that's like the, the, the downside of it, but it's all, but I think there's all upside when it comes to it and having this the accountability at the council level, level and having council input as to uh, especially on large ticket purchases, it's I think probably originally it was probably in the 250 range, and then it just evolved over time when you went from you know half a billion dollars to 2.7 state valuation. So uh, uh, this is an excellent opportunity to revise the, the policy. 
Okay. Um, I'll open it up to discussion amongst counselors. Is there anybody that has thoughts on this? Go ahead, Jeremy. Um, thanks for um, teeing that up and thanks for doing the legwork on, on the memo, John. I, I think my general gut is saying I'm, I'm leaning toward setting the value at that at that 200,000, 250, 200,000 dollar level. I, I think it's, I, I appreciate the points um, that, that both John and, and Matt made about the value of this. And I, I think it is important for the council to have input on, on uh, many of these decisions. I also, you know, if the risk of setting this as a percentage of valuation is that um, it, 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 it's not entirely clear always what the, what the threshold is and then also you know the valuation goes up and eventually the amount that triggers it goes up i think the risk of setting it too low is that it just crowds the council's agenda you know at some point with uh with decisions that you know probably can safely be made by by the manager and, and finance director um so i, I think 250 somewhere around 200 250 probably strikes that balance for my thinking Um, I, I agree with John's recommendation of $100,000. I think a quarter of a million dollars is a lot of money to not have the council weigh in on. Um, I, I understand that, you know, $100,000 for a piece of equipment is pretty uh, standard. But uh, I really think the council needs to have their uh, um, fingers on the pulse because one of our key um, goals is to be fiscally responsible. Uh, so I, I don't want to surprise you, John, but I agree with you, $100,000. <laughs> All right, I can go now. Uh, go ahead, Valerie. Um, yeah, I, I agree with, with you, Penny. I, and thank you, John, so much for putting this together and bringing it to our attention. I'm just curious, Matt, where, where is that line of what is too low? Um, to me, 100,000 sounds about right, but I'm not doing the purchasing. It, do you have a lot of items that are 100,000 that you're purchasing? No. Uh, 50,000, I mean, where, what do you think is, is uh, too low? You know, a hundred is probably that sweet spot. If, if you wanted to find that, we, anything over a hundred really is, it's something that, I mean, we, we've probably extensively reviewed that during the budget process through the CIP uh, function. And then something lesser than that would be, you know, you're talking maybe like larger vehicles, you know, like a larger, larger than your standard pickup truck, something of a, of a larger equipment item, but that's, if it's over a hundred, it's something that's pretty substantial. So that would probably work, work very well. Uh, the one we have this year, uh, the, well, the two items that come to mind right off the top would be the loader at the, uh, at the, at the recycling center or the public works loader um, that we had for 160 in there. Uh, bids came back a lot less than that, which is great news. Uh, so we, we went through that bid process last week and then the engine, which is, you know, engine two is in the roughly the 600,000 range. So, uh, and those there, I mean, we can line that up to have that ready to go uh, for council approval. So those aren't, I mean, yeah, it's, it, they are the larger ones. The smaller stuff, I think, falls underneath that $100,000 capacity. Okay. And that's- I, I was- oh, just Go ahead, Van. Sorry, I thought you were done. That's not going to hold up the contracts, or there's not time of the essence in any of these contracts. No, I, I think like with the with the engine, that's that's something where we are, we'd have gone out and used the uh, the Houston Galveston uh, bid specs on that, which was uh, was created nationally, so that we will follow through that that uh, that that joint bid process. And then with the loader, we went out to that to RFP, and that and that came back. So. Um, we'll come back with a recommendation for council for that for, for the first meeting in July. Uh, we'll let the bidder know who the apparent low bidder was and what our recommendation will be, but it'll be, it'll be uh, subject to council approval on this date, uh, but then they can go forward and do their ordering. So 
I think if we can, like this time of year, we function everything towards July 1st anyway. So if you wait until that first council meeting in July, it's, it's not going to put us back months uh, at this point in time. Okay, thanks. I was just gonna add that I, when, when we were thinking about this item, I didn't go back to a lot of them, but I, I went back to a few handful of the weekly warrants. And so I've been looking at those for five of my six years on the council as either chair or finance chair. And I seldom remember seeing something in the six figures for a purchase, right? I mean, most of the time, if it's a six figure thing, it's something that's going to like, uh, you know, the healthcare or pension payments or something like that. There's, there's very few things that ever reach the six figure number. Um, you know, it's, 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 I don't want to say it's rare, but it's, it, you know, you might have a, a couple, you know, every couple of months or something like that. So um, I, I think that that's a pretty good threshold and I agree with John's recommendation. So um, other thoughts specifically on the purchasing policy? Go ahead, Nicole. Um, I'm just thinking, you know, forward, we're talking next about a five-year review period of things. And, you know, a police cruiser is $60,000 right now. $100,000 in five years might come close to the price of a, a police cruiser. I mean, hopefully not. But, you know, are we setting the town up um, for not investing in infrastructure improvements if people want to vote no on everything. So just something to consider about 100,000 if there's anything we can do for inflation or maybe this is a type of thing that gets reviewed every three years and not every five years, which is another conversation coming up next. But I just, I know we don't have a lot today, but we also know the direction that costs are going. So Nicole, do you mean, do just councilors want to vote no on everything? Because this is still not referendum. This is just right. So I think the policy as stated would be for expenses over a hundred thousand dollars. The council would have to right. approve them. So if five years from now, I don't know, everyone wants to vote no on everything because they want to spend no money. Are we putting things like culverts at risk? Um, you know, where's the the health of the town for some of these expenses and you know, I don't know what future councils will think or do. It's just one of those $100,000 could be projects that are sidewalks. Go ahead, Penny. I just want to respond to Nicole's point because I'm a little confused by it. Um, if, if what you're saying is that setting the threshold higher would potentially allow decision making basically on the ground and council would not have uh, input into that decision making. That's a confusing statement to me. Is that what you said? I don't think I'm making it about um, the council not having input in expenses, but let's say I'd like to be aware of things being over a hundred thousand, but are we putting the council five years from now in a position where a hundred thousand dollars is there approving police cars is mostly what I'm saying. Like, are we going to say no to things that the town actually needs? because $100,000 doesn't mean as much in a few years. So that's where I'm at for today. I'm fine with $100,000. Yeah, the but police cars, oh. police cars sit in the, the budget for the police department and we go through that and, and vote on that as part of the budget process, whether they- Okay, so this is things that falls outside, outside of the budget then. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. You got it. Then that makes oh, okay. sense. Okay, thank you. okay, cool, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to reemphasize that point that, that you know, John, in, in the second to last paragraph of the memo reiterates the fact that there has to have been a budget appropriation to begin with, and that that's all something that by and large happens through our budgeting process and approvals process. And so this is just the matter of, you know, completing that purchase. So, and, and, and uh, what constraints are on 
the manager or other purchasing agent, um, well, in this case, just the manager, but the, you know, on the manager in order to fulfill that agreement. So, um, I, so I, I think the, the question about in, inflation is generally one to keep an eye on for other reasons too. Um, so I don't know, I, I do agree, Nicole, I'm not sure if the, if the five year period, and we'll talk about that in a minute is too long, you know, you know, in much bigger terms, I've, I, this has actually caused me to wonder whether the, the million dollar threshold, when, when was the million dollar um, change to the charter made, Matt or John? How long, I mean, that's 15 years ago, maybe? Yeah. 10, it's, 10 or 15 it's 10 years ago? 10 to 15 years, yeah, exactly. I mean, I, you know, I did make the comment a couple of years ago, it doesn't take very much to get to a million dollars of something these days. And so um, I know it's a, a large lift to, because that's now embedded in the charter to try and change that. But uh, 15 years or so with no adjustment on that is probably something that not in the immediate near term, but, um, you know, relatively, you know, uh, short term, we, sh we should maybe begin having some discussion about as to whether that that is enough, um, you know, for something. So I know we had to do some financial gymnastics to make make it work on the fire. The last, you know, the ladder truck, for example, um, and you know, those kinds of critical infrastructure things concern me more. Like what Nicole was just saying of, well, you'd hate to have something that's a really important thing for the town that just because whichever way the wind is blowing, folks decided. Yeah, I don't. I don't really feel like spending that 1.25 million on that ladder truck or something. So, um, so anyway, that's a little bit of a tangent, but I think I think it all wraps into the discussion of things cost more than they used to, and so um, we should probably make sure that our policies are aligned appropriately. So, I don't know if that's a unless anybody had any other comments on the threshold recommended by John here. I don't know if that is a good opportunity to segue into the policy on policies. Oh, uh, Gretchen, sorry. There we go. Um, so I'm I'm in agreement about the hundred thousand. Um, I did just want to point out before we move on to the um, policy of policies, in section N, for some reason when we were having this discussion, I thought we were saying we would reimburse up to twenty five dollars in taxes, not the taxes on up to twenty five dollars of purchases. I can't. I, Jamie, was it you that? suggested that maybe I can't remember but I, I had a different recollection from our meeting about section N. So just fun to um else. Valerie raised the question oh, about Valerie. sales tax reimbursement mm -hmm. and the number of ten dollars was thrown out but it was not clear if it was ten dollars of sales tax reimbursement or ten dollars of value purchase. Um, I took a look at ten dollars in value purchase and said that's not much and uh, increased it by one and a half times to bring it up to $25. In addition, I added language that said that multiple uh, invoices do not count as a single 25. It's each invoice separately um, to calculate that. The, the amount can be changed as the council sees fit. Um, you can leave it open as any sales tax is reimbursable, or you can set a threshold. I'm fine with whatever way you want to go. In terms of the, uh, the other changes, uh, I would just ask that uh, before we finish up here tonight, that I get clear direction so I can adjust the document and present it for next week's board meet, uh, council meeting so that it's, it's clear exactly what you folks have accepted. Go ahead, Valerie. I, my understanding is that you had said that if it was um, a purchase of more than $100, they would get it approved, is what I was thinking. They'd get it approved and then the town would, the town uses its purchasing power, right? To, to uh, buy things without sales tax. The town does use its, uh, it, it, first of all, we would much prefer employees to go through the town's purchasing uh, mechanism. 
than to use their own money and seek reimbursement. Um, I don't recall, but it's been a month, but I don't recall any conversation about $100. Um, I do recall that I said that up to this point, if public works employee is seeking clothing reimbursement, I've allowed the sales tax to be reimbursed because it is against the total that's available to them. Um, in response to the question about reimbursing them, let me just back up a little bit. The practice in accounts payable when I got here was we don't reimburse sales tax. And so department heads were told not to include that. And so that was the practice. It was not the policy because the policy was quiet on that. So I, I drafted some language to try and address that. Again, if you want the policy to say that uh, we can reimburse the employee for whatever they lay out, I can adjust the language to incorporate that. So long as it's clear in the policy, the auditors have no ability to raise a concern about it. Did I answer your question, Valerie, or address your point? Yeah, yeah, I, I think what we were saying is that, um, maybe what John was saying is that um, five, $5, $10 reimbursement of tax wouldn't be much more than $100. Maybe that's what we were, were saying. Okay. Something like that like that if we were reimbursing five to ten dollars yeah my my concern was just um clothing and then people who um they take you know the, the debate team they all go out to dinner and somebody puts it on their credit card and they're not going to get reimbursed um that was my concern yeah let me just let me just clarify something here this policy does not apply to the school department Okay. Um, they have their own policy and their policy is that they do not reimburse sales tax. Okay. Gretchen, did you have something else you wanted to add? Sorry, no, I was gonna just say, since I'm the one that brought it up, I just wanted to say I, I'm fine with where it's at. I just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention in case it wasn't what we had meant, but it's fine with me, so. Thanks. John, is it your opinion that the relaxing this will, I, my assumption is that it does not help to <laughs> um, have people adhere to the stated policy of, you know, going through the purchasing process versus reimbursement process. So are you, do you, do you have concerns about how the, the purchasing process will be adhered to when we're relaxing this component of the reimbursement process, potentially. Does that make sense? It, it does. Um, I don't, just I think as Matthew um, and the finance uh, committee review the warrants, um, Matthew has been very clear about taking a look at reimbursements to employees. And if we see employees starting to um, take advantage of the situation and get around the town's uh, preferences on how to go about purchasing, he can step in and say, enough is enough and we're not doing it anymore. Um, one area is that boards and committees, um, the uh, conservation committee uh, or commission um, one of their members has purchased uh, materials for boardwalks on the trails, used his own money, and I authorized the reimbursement to that person uh, for the sales tax that was paid. Uh, under this policy, the person is going to have to start going through the town's uh, process rather than going out on his own. Um, and that is really how it should be handled. Uh, we should not have people going off and buying whatever they want and then saying they expect the town to pay them back. I agree with that. Mr. Chairman, 
Uh, yeah. If, if I may, the uh, yeah, we're talking about uh, uh, casual purchases as well. So you know, it's 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 a small small ticket item that they that there would be it'd be more of a convenience item if it was something uh, say an off supply or 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 a smaller piece of equipment or something along those lines. Uh, we would be using you know the department would be using. Uh, it's either purchasing ability to that. Uh, so you, so they're they're infrequent, but when they do happen, I think the 25 would will work as a a place going forward, and uh, should it should function well for us. I mean, I think I think public works and public safety for personal equipment is probably the most relevant and frequent example of this, right? Yeah. I mean, there's there's. I can't think of a ton of other stuff other than incidental purchases that somebody might make. As you just described, you know, uh, oh, I was, you know, we're ha having a lunch meeting or something and, you know, purchase some sandwiches at sea salt or something like that. You know, I mean, I, I, I feel like I feel like the personal equipment stuff is the stuff that really is the most relevant here. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. Good. Any other comments? OK, so. Um, John, can we transition into the other item? Sure, absolutely. So there is a uh, there's a request made uh, at the uh, May 5th meeting to take a look at, again, I'm terming policy on policies. Um, and I, I did a first draft that uh, is included in your package. Uh, the first section uh, is just definitions. The second one is the collection and distribution of policies, which says that uh, the town has got to pull all of its policies together. It has to make copies available to the council. So the council knows what the policies are that it is responsible for uh, overseeing and to make sure that those policies are available both to department heads and are available to the public. And as was brought up, uh, the review, I took an arbitrary five-year review, but I also built in there uh, the ability to review uh, less or more frequently than five years. Uh, and uh, note a town counselor may request a review of a town policy through the town manager or a town council chairman, and staff may bring forward recommendations. So in the matter of uh, setting a threshold for council review of purchases under the uh, revised purchasing policy, certainly if uh, inflation starts to move up the cost of items and we start to see that, that it puts an encumbrance upon the council's time, it can be brought up through uh, the town manager or the council chair by a, uh, a town counselor or by a department head to take another look at that policy and make a recommendation on changing the, uh, the amount of the threshold. Okay. Uh, and Matt, I'll ask you again, is there anything you wanted to add in addition to that or? I think it's uh, yeah. I think this will be a nice functioning policy for us to have. It's good to have a guideline yep. and overarching for every for all the policies. Uh, the, the one thing Go I ahead, did John. build in here was, I'm sorry. One thing I did build in here was uh, a one-year opportunity for staff to go back and review uh, agendas and minutes to make sure that they pull together all of the policies that have been adopted over the years. Um, so that uh, we don't say, well, yeah, it, it should be there, but we couldn't find it. And uh, we have to have this done in six months or three months. So setting a, a one year was an attempt just to recognize that there's gonna be a lot of work to go in. It may not take that long, uh, at which time the town manager should report back and say, everything is done. Here's your copy of the policies, um, and we've incorporated the review dates, and we'll plan accordingly. I've been watching a lot of head nodding. Uh, does anybody have any comments? This seems pretty straightforward to me. I like this. 
Any comments from anybody? Okay. Oh, great. So do you have everything you need, John, as far as the first item goes? I, uh, I think we really- I do. Uh, I, okay. I will use the 100,000. I will uh, update the document and have it available for next week's uh, council meeting. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Stay cool. Good night. All right, so now we'll move to the um, amendments to the library policies. Um, it was previously uh, introduced by Rachel. And as she mentioned, she's got some folks from the library committee uh, joining the meeting as well. So while Matt promotes Jason and Tim, welcome them in. And Rachel, do you wanna take over to tee this up? Sure. Um so I've been working um, with the staff and with the committee to uh, take a little look at all of the library policies um, and revise them and in some cases um, draft them uh, in places where uh, we haven't had a policy to address uh, particular issues. So since the, the new library building opened, um, there have been uh, a number of um, changes in use. Um, I think just the attractiveness of the building, the space, um, you know, we, all of the reasons for uh, needing the new building in the first place, the, the need for more space. Um, uh, I think that it, the older library, we had some of these issues, but not to the degree that um, we do in the new building. And I think um, there's, been a lot of frustration among staff um, over the last, what has it been, five years um, since the building opened of um, really not having a clear sense of how to deal with some of the situations that have arisen on a, on a regular basis. Um, and so the intent of these, this, this is the first batch of policies that we'll be bringing you more later in the year. Um, but these are the ones that really deal with the use of the building um, and the use of our, um, our space and our services. And um, as you could see from the previous policies, they were, you know, the ones that are currently on the books are, are pretty um, sketchy. Uh, there's not a lot of detail in there and not a lot to, to go on. Um, in terms of um, ensuring that people who come into the space um, have an equitable and pleasant and um, appropriate uh, use of the library's resources. So the general use policy just basically is laying out, um, this is what we're here for, and this is, uh, these are the kinds of activities that we um, encourage and, and want to have happen in the, the kind of resources and the services we provide um, and uh, inappropriate uses and what giving staff a, um, a, a clear set of guidelines for dealing with situations that might arise that, that are in violation of those policies or of the general use policy. Same thing with food and beverage. Um, we have had such uh, difficulty um, I think that initially we felt that if we banned food and beverages all together, um, we were going to end up with food stuffed behind bookshelves um, and, and that sort of thing. So we, we had a pretty, um, a pretty open policy, um, which kind of, and it, it was more of a practice, more of a procedural thing, not written down, but, you know, covered beverages. And, and then at some point, when we had pizzas being delivered in the library and things like that, it was like, okay, well, there's, there's gotta be some limits here. So, so maybe no, no hot and messy foods. So that was sort of like where we went with it. And, and honestly, um, it is a library after all. <laughs> and, and while we want people to, to feel comfortable in the space, have a cup of coffee or have their water, have a snack, um, you know, it's not a place to consume a meal. And, and it's, it's really, we have ant problems in the library um, as we do in lots of the town buildings, but it's exacerbated by crumbs. And that leads us to, well, we'll, we'll go to the safe child and vulnerable adults policy in a minute, but, but um, just as a brief intro, um, the computer use and internet policy 
uh, also revised um, to uh, sort of define um, a difference between the, the computers in the adult space versus um, are on the main floor versus in the children's room. Um, frequently after school, adults are sort of uh, booted out or have been uh, because kids uh, would come in after school and take over those computers and play video games on them. And um, many libraries uh, make a distinction between, uh, you know, age limit for libraries in an adult area versus those in the children's room. So there's that. And then finally, that brings us to the safe child and vulnerable adults policy, which um, is, uh, you know, we haven't had a, a vulnerable adults policy and our policy on unattended children um, at the time that that was written many, many, many years ago uh, when it was first drafted that said children could be in the building or could be unattended. It wasn't necessarily in the building, unattended um, if they were six and above. Now, I was on the, I sat in on the, what was then the Board of Trustees uh, policy committee meetings at that point. And this was a different time. <laughs> I remember when we wrote that policy and we chose that age, the thinking was simply that a child could be in the children's part of the library while an adult was maybe in the adult part of the library. We weren't thinking of kids being completely by themselves. It wasn't even on the radar at that point. And, um, and what we've seen happen since the library building, uh, new building opened is um, floods of kids um, coming into the library after school who are really too young to manage their own behavior on their own. And, um, and really a lot of safety issues associated with that as well as behavioral issues. But the behavioral issues are, are um, uh, tangential with the, with the safety issues. And, you know, as I mentioned in, in the memo, um, in drafting these policies, um, Megan, uh, my children's librarian and I, met with uh, Donna and um, the school resource officer, Officer Galvin, um, Kim Sturgeon, one of the middle school social workers, uh, Kathy from um, Community Services, and, um, and uh, uh, Troy Eastman, uh, middle school principal, um, to get their input on this because I feel like, you know, there's clearly, this is, this is more than a library issue. Um, kids, come to the library after school, they aren't there to use library resources. They're there to hang out until they get picked up at the end of the day. And it would be one thing if, if kids were coming into the library in hordes and sitting down and working on their homework, reading books, but that is not at all um, what happens. Um, there may be one or two kids who, whose intent may be even to do that. You know, that's why they're coming to the library. But they see all their friends, and then they're in a horde, and they're, you know, we we don't we're we're free. <laughs> um, and I think there's a, a misunderstanding among um, parents that uh, the library is not having your children hang out at the library after school is not like not equivalent to them being at school. We as librarians don't act in loco parentis. We are we don't know who is coming in. We don't take names when they come in. They're not signing up. We don't necessarily know their names. Um, some of them we get to know, but we don't necessarily know who they are, who, how to contact whoever their parent is. They may or may not have a library card, which would be an, an access to our database to figure out you know, who to call. Um, so, so it really becomes an issue of um, you know, kids, are developmentally not able to, to regulate their own behavior, to make wise judgments on their own um, of the ages that we have seen at the library. And, and as I laid out in the memo, some of the incidents and some of the regular occurrences that we deal with um, on a regular basis. Um, and, and the reason that I included um, Kim Sturgeon from, from the uh, middle school, but she and I have had multiple conversations uh, when I was children's librarian over the years of kids coming to her to tell her about 
bullying incidents that they encountered at the library that staff are completely unaware of because we are not there to super we're not we're not supervising children we're not we're there to help people use library resources we aren't there to um, have our eyes on the kids all the time to see what they're doing and who's just saying what to whom and who's doing what to whom and you know it's really problematic and i think um we really just we want to have some a clear understanding um not only for staff and how to handle situations that come up but also for parents for the public to understand what the appropriate use of the library and library resources is um so um so um, hey Rachel, can you yeah. do um, can you quantify roughly the the number of kids you're talking about generally that you see in these instances? I mean, um, is it two after dozen school, more? I would say anywhere. Um, we're talking upper elementary, younger middle school students coming in the library after school, anywhere from fifteen to maybe 30 um, after yeah. school and um, you know they are they are they you know as soon as 2 30 hits when middle school gets out doors swing open floods of kids backpacks instruments dropped everywhere and then they leave usually to go across the street to cumberland farms and come back with sometimes I have actually seen a literal bucket with that bags of candy right. are poured into that are then passed out to all their friends. So not only do you have kids on their own, you have them hopped up on sugar <laughs> and um, and also uh, a, sitting there on screens and playing video games for hours on end, which again, I, as a parent, um, to, to see this happening on a daily basis, just knowing, I don't think this is what the parents think their children are doing or would approve right. of what they're doing. But it is not my role as the children's librarian to, to say, ah, 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 or to tell the parent, uh, you know what, your child has had, you know, three and a half hours of uninterrupted screen time this afternoon. Yeah. That, that's not not the role of, of, of a librarian. Um, just follow up question too. Is it, would you say that it's generally the same 15 to 30 kids? I know that you're not keeping track or checking kids in, but I mean, just for, definitely there's the, there are the, definitely there are definite regulars yes yeah, yeah okay okay thanks yeah did you did you have further or was that oh me sort of yeah yeah sorry um, <laughs> I, I no i mean I'm, question, I'm happy but... to i'm happy happy to yeah. answer um you know other questions that I, I would also just point out too in in instances where it has gotten so egregious where i needed to follow up with a parent um or where actual damage was done we had a group of kids who absolutely trashed um the game room um spilled soda on the floor on the furniture chip bags everywhere um just absolute mess um in a room where they had been explicitly told there was no food allowed in that room uh, when they mm -hmm. signed it out they had signed it out with fake names um so uh in fact one of them had had used the name billy eilish which you probably know that billy eilish is a pop star um it was a boy no who used the name the library <laughs> yeah yeah and the staff member who was not up on the um you know pop music at the time didn't <laughs> bat an eye because oh it's okay your name's billy eilish you know so again it's really difficult then to follow up when um fake names are being given and kids know they're they're misbehaving and know they're breaking rules and there really is no accountability um you know, in the way that it would be in a school where they're they're they are being supervised and accounted for, and um, you know, and and again, as I as I mentioned, you know, on a daily basis, multiple phone calls from parents, grandparents wanting to speak to their child, who we may not know who they are. We, you know, they may be irritated that we don't know who they are. I think there's a misunderstanding of what the library is. 
Um, so having to then go wander around looking for a child because the parent is on the phone and wants to speak to them um, or wants to know if they're there. And, you know, and in some ways this, it really is more akin to letting your young child, um, you know, dropping them off at the mall for hours. Um, and, or even if they, it is closer to having this group, this, these hordes of kids who are let out of school come over to say town hall and hang out in the council chambers. I mean, it's the same level of service and misuse of resource as it is at the library. It, if they are not using library resources, if they're not there um, actually using the building in the way it was intended, they there is no reason for them to be there other than they have nowhere else to be. Um, and, you know, as, as we discovered in, in talking with um, Kathy at Community Services and, and Troy Eastman, you know, that it is, has become a known thing that, uh, you know, it's, there's no supervision. If we go to the library after school, we can do whatever we want. Therefore, I don't need you to sign me up for aftercare because I can just go to the library and I don't wanna to go to aftercare because it's more fun at the library. And I don't wanna sign up for these um, activities at the middle school after school because I can go to the library. And so that's, you know, when, when the town is offering after school care for that age group and is offering after school activities, but they are being um, rejected in favor of what's seen as a, as a kind of a, um, an unmoderated, more fun space to, to be, um, you know, to be on your own. Um, I think that's a problem. Um, I see Penny's got her hand raised. I wanted to first, you know, thank you for the very thorough you know, memo and detail, in particular, the really valuable, you know, anecdotal examples that you wove through the memo, which I know are based in true stories and realities of things happening and not just for illustrative purposes. Um, so thank you to you and the um, committee, and the two folks in the committee that are here representing the committee. I, I think before we kick into the conversation about it, what, what strikes me and the reason I was really asking the probing questions about sort of this specific use. And I'm, I'm curious to understand a little bit more out of what came out of, I'm glad that you pulled all those people together that you said, um, mm -hmm. Kathy and Troy and Officer Galvin and Kim and everybody. I, I'm curious a little bit of what came out of that because the other things that you've laid out are really more etiquette, decorum, sort of mm -hmm. expectations and reestablishing expectations. This to me struck me as I read it and hear you talk about it this evening as much more of a, we we have an identified need for a you know somewhat regular cohort of kids here, mm -hmm. yet we don't have the appropriate outlet for them. So mm -hmm. you know, I, and what it actually reminded me of in the town that I grew up in in New Jersey, when I was roughly that age, um, our what we called our rec department, but you know like our community services opened up in an underutilized unused space in the middle school, something that they called the teen center. Mm -hmm. And I know that community services for the rec camp in the summer offers teen scene, which is sort of a, you know, slightly, you know, cooler version of rec camp for those age appropriate kids. But I'm just, I'm just wondering if we've identified through what is actually happening with these kids and this activity at the library, a need for something, some kind of servicing that is, not something you sign up for through, you know, the, the teen center that I just described, you could drop in or drop out just like these kids are at the library. You didn't have to be registered. You didn't have to sign up for anything. They were, you know, video game stations, a pool table, a ping pong table, you know, and there was an adult there whose role was to supervise that. It wasn't just a free for all and Lord of the Flies or anything. Right. But um, so Matt, I don't, I don't know if, you know, and you know, long winded explanation here, but I, I think, I think what I'm seeing here is that there's a specific need that's not being met and maybe the solution is create a way to meet that need in an alternative venue somehow, some way, so. Well, I- We can do, we can do through programming at community services, uh, work with Kathy and Kelly, because Kelly knows all the kids uh, in, that, in that age group as well. And to find something that's less structured, but available, maybe, I mean, I, 
we can work with them to see what their thoughts may be. But uh, we, I think it's a great opportunity, uh, quite honestly, uh, to, to find something other than what we're what Rachel's been experiencing for a while. Because the, the thing yeah. that's interesting to me is the fact that they're already going to the library to do this. They don't have a reluctance to doing it somewhere that's like on a town property. Yeah, like I remember right. when this teen center in my town opened up, it was like, oh, well, is that really the cool place to go? And it took a little while. And eventually people really thought that it was fun and there was stuff to do and you could, it was laid back and you could just chill out and whatever. It was unstructured. It wasn't like signing up for a program. Mm -hmm. Um, but because it was brand new, there was that hurdle to overcome. But it seems to me that with these kids already going to the library, they've already bought into the fact that, or maybe just been told by their parents because that's where they need to go. <laughs> but um, they, you know, they already are cool with sort of, you know, hanging out at some town space. It's just that they're not at the right one is what I feel like the situation is. So I, I absolutely um, agree. Can, if I can just jump in for yeah. a sec. Um, our, our former team librarian um, who was from... Uh, Try, Exeter, New Hampshire, uh, maybe it was Exeter. She had said that when she was a teen, um, her school had uh, the YMCA came in in the afternoons and ran a program and that it was something that, I guess that is something that the YMCA does or can do or, and there may be other organizations that do that where it's, it's not in their own building but they go and they do it at a school. So, you know, that had been one of her recommendations was, was something along those lines. But I absolutely agree that I, I feel it is a community issue. Um, I don't want to, um, we absolutely want kids to use the library. We want them to use the library, though, for what it's there for. But I do feel there is definitely a need for some kind of a, a place where, you know, young adolescents can go and hang out and be cared for and be safe. Um, it's, it's not the library, but I do feel there is that need. And, and prior to COVID, um, you know, at, at, the, at the TML committee meeting that we had planned that had then got canceled because of COVID, right? That on the agenda was actually um, having a, uh, making plans for a community-wide conversation about this issue because we knew we needed to change these policies, but we didn't want to just all of a sudden say, oop, we're done. Um, COVID presented a, a, an opportunity to, okay, we've had this, this pause. And, um, and I kind of steered away from that community conversation idea after having that meeting with um, the whole group that, that we did because it seemed like, okay, when we, when we reopen, when, we, when things come back to normal is the time to introduce a change. And um, but I am, I still do believe that this is something that, that the community should be involved in, maybe perhaps not in so much, um, you know, I, I think the policy for the library definitely needs to be changed, but I think a broader community conversation about um, how do we serve this group of kids that are at loose ends after school um, is, is definitely warranted. Penny, uh, you had your hand up first and then Gretchen. Go ahead. Uh, yes, I um, first want to say I think that work that you've done on the policy is just fabulous. So Thank you. Uh, the, the policy and I read through it, I, it all uh, you've well thought out, but I came to a, a, a similar thing as, uh, as Jamie. And, um, and I'll tell you that way back in the 1970s, uh, we kids actually designed their teen center. Mm -hmm. And I, I would propose that just as Jamie has done and, and you as well, Rachel, um, I think we pull the kids together and say, how do we create a, a space that can work for you? Because I think it should be designed by the kids or otherwise it's a bunch of adults saying mm -hmm. we create this space and trust me, you're gonna have a great time. Um, and um, I know that uh, many communities back at that time identified uh, separate buildings that were specifically for the teen centers. And so that they were going to a different space. It wasn't something within a school. It wasn't something within an existing structure um, mm -hmm. that they go, uh, 
you know, community services has lane programs. I don't want to go and hang out there. Um, and so uh, as I was reading it through this, I said, okay, so we've got to figure out what we put together for kids and what will meet their needs because we don't have uh, a boys and a, a girls club in Cape Elizabeth. Um, and we don't have a YMCA and we don't have those things. So have the kids get together and design programs uh, or a place that they want to go hang out and make sure there's a machine that has chips and soda. <laughs> so anyway, that's what I was thinking. Number one, the, uh, the policies you put out there are fabulous. I have no problems with them whatsoever. So I think we're all kind of in the same place. Let's solve the problem now, which is what, what can these kids do? Uh, where can they hang out and be safe? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Penny. Go ahead, Gretchen. Yep. Thanks. Um, hi, Rachel. Hi. <laughs> um, so I'm going to echo Jamie and Penny, I think, and I agree this, uh, this was all wonderful and I absolutely appreciate all the anecdotes and I can sympathize, I think, and, and understand a little bit the, the situation that you're in. Um, and I think it's wonderful, the folks that you were able to bring together. It sounds like a lot of thought and a lot of work went into this already. So I appreciate that. But I am I think I'm in the same space that um, Jamie and Penny are right now. It sounds like um, I have a kid right around this age. And I know that this is a tough one. By the time he hit fifth grade, aftercare wasn't so cool anymore. And by sixth grade, it was an absolute no-go. Um, he started staying home alone. Um, did maybe go to the library a couple times. Hopefully he was not one of your, <laughs> your hooligans. Um, but it's kind of tough because I was wondering a little bit about where this 13 cutoff came from, just because again, it's like an in-between age. I think a lot of 12 and even 11 year olds are able to be unsupervised. And so it feels a little hard for me to square that my kid can go to the mall by himself or he can ride his bike around town and go to Fort Williams, but he can't go to the library. So I agree that maybe, I love Jamie and Penny's idea here of maybe shifting it just somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, I also think it sounds to me, I know I wrote down here, I think mis the words misunderstanding and misconception came up quite a few times. And I think that that could maybe be solved hopefully a little bit with more communication. I would, I'm on the middle school parent association and I would put a huge um, shout out to try to use those because the two parent associations have Facebook pages and weekly newsletters. So maybe saying things like, hey, we have this program this week. Kids are welcome. Just as a reminder, if it's outside of program, like there's not supervision, they need to, you know, just to kind of mm -hmm. communicate the expectations a little more yeah. um, as maybe another another solution. But I, I, I like where we're going with maybe just finding a a different outlet because um, I would feel a little uncomfortable discouraging kids from going to the library. Maybe we can just <laughs> send them elsewhere. So, but I really so, appreciate all the work they went into this, Sam. Yeah. Thank you. The, the mm -hmm. 13 age limit. So um, that came as a result of the meeting. Um, we had been uh, thinking that 11 was the age we were going to go for. Um, but after hearing from um, the people on the school side um, and hearing the, their recommendation of, of 13, that because it's the fifth and sixth graders who are, there are activities being provided for that they are rejecting in favor of, of being unsupervised at the library. And that was more comfortable to us. We just thought that, you know, 13 was going to be a hard, hard age to, to, to draw that line um, because it does seem old, but given what we've experienced and, you know, and it also, it's worth pointing out when it, one kid by themselves might behave perfectly fine um, and on their own, but when their friends show up, and maybe their friend has a wad of money and says, I'm going to go, you want, let's go over to Cumberland Farms and buy candy. You know, all bets are off. And so, so, and the, the judgment and the, the setting limits for oneself is, is not, they're just developmentally not capable. It's, it's not that they're, um, you know, nefariously 
not following rules or what they they just developmentally their brains aren't there um so we're talking you know 10 11 10 and 11 12 year olds you know they especially when you add sugar and screens to the mix there's there's a whole lot of um not so great limit setting uh, um, because they're they're just not capable of doing it, and um, and so you know it was after that meeting where you know hearing their feedback um, and their affirmation of of what our our own gut was telling us was was the right age, um, which was to go higher to to thirteen. Um, you know that that's where we we. Uh, we landed on that, and and it wasn't in a vacuum. Um, I um, I looked at sample policies from all over the country and and all over the state, and and you know some libraries have 14. Um, you know, so it's um, I would say there's a range. Um, eight is the youngest I've seen. Um, 11, uh, 10, 11 is pretty common, but um, 13 is is one of those. You know, if you're going to define a, a teenager as 13 to 17, um, a child is is then 12 and below, and that seemed to be a clear cutoff. Especially when we wanted to be consistent when we're looking at the use of computers. That um, you know, at 13, most kids have their school issued um, devices as well. So. So it, most teenagers are going to use their own devices rather than the um, adult computers. So having that cutoff for the up, the computers upstairs to have a, a quiet space for adults to work at the computers, and you know if a, if a teenager who doesn't have a device needed to use one of those computers, we're not so concerned about a 13, 14, 15, 16 year old, you know, sitting down and and using a computer, and they're unlikely to do so because they, you know. They have they have their own unless it's a matter of desperation they have to print out something for school um, but that seemed to be a reasonable area whereas if we if we said 10 was the age then you know what do we so are we going to say okay 10 and 10 and younger um, you know what do we do with those 11 and 12 year olds in are they going to be playing video games on the adult computers you know I mean the, that is a, a an age where we have seen problems with bullying, we've seen problems with, you know, we even had one kid, um, sixth grader, uh, videotape another kid in the bathroom and then uh, post it online. Um, so, you know, these things, <laughs> these things happen because there's really bad judgment, <laughs> um, kids of that age level. So um, they don't think about consequences, they don't think about the impact, they don't have anybody standing there saying, no, you know, who's going to, staff aren't going to go into the bathroom and watch what the kids are doing in the bathroom, obviously. So, you know, there are lots of places in the library that are out of sight um, and very easily um, taken advantage of for whatever bad decision making might be going on. So, um, so that's just a little background on where that 13 number came from. Nicole and then Valerie. As someone who has gone to the library to work in quiet where it's not my office and um, I usually try to get myself out of there at two o'clock. I know this this feeling um, and I know when I don't hit the two o'clock because I'm in the flow and then the noise comes in. Um, it's always struck me very odd because my relationship with the library, even as a kid, was like silence, no talking. And obviously times have changed because everyone has a computer in their pocket. but. Um, I appreciate all the detail that went into this. I was also going to ask about the age cutoff because 13 seems pretty high to me because I, I know 12 year olds can be in seventh grade and can have, you know, research papers that they need to work on. But like you said, when there's other kids around you, judgment isn't there. Um, the one thing I wanted to bring up with this though is uh, the environment. You know, I took pause when I came into the library and noticed there's a video game room. You know, when you're putting out marketing materials like we have a video game room, are you inviting some of that behavior and is that changing with the reopening that, you know, you're not going to have a place like that? So that's just something I noticed that, of course, I think this is a place to play. You have games here. So uh, just to answer that, um, no, we don't. I did away with the game room. We do not have the game room anymore. Um, that was 
And I have to say that was that was something that I think the library building committee um, decided was a good idea um, to attract teenagers to the library. Um, in practice, it was not a, 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 a great use of the space. Um, and, and if you recall, the original location of that game room was um, next to, it was one of the study rooms. So you had game room, study room, study room. Um, not a good idea <laughs> to have <laughs> video games next to what are supposed to be quiet study rooms. So it had gotten moved downstairs to what had been designated as the media lab um, just before COVID happened. Uh, and and I'll, I'll say the, the reason for um, eliminating the game room is just what you said. It's, it's, not, it's not a necessary thing in the library. Um, it is an attractive nuisance, um, an unsupervised room, dark, often, you know, enclosed, not a good, good use of, of the space. Um, and uh, so just before COVID, I had a, a group of um, a, a pair of USM media studies students who had come to me um, in the fall last year looking for a senior project. And, um, and I had told them, you know, I had wanted to convert that, that game room back into what its original purpose was, which was a media lab. Um, it has a green wall for a green screen and, and uh, we have a, a, one of those super max that's with film editing software. And we were hoping to turn it into sort of a, a, an audio and video streaming, uh, room. So they they did all the research, they priced it all out, they planned out what would happen and it was great and they turned in their project and then COVID happened. So that's been on hold. Um, but that is something that we plan to go back to doing. I even had soundproofing put in um, in the elevator room, which is right next to that room so that so that the sound when the elevator goes up and down isn't going to be an issue. At any rate, I don't mean to get off the subject, but just so you know that that was a piece of this and and the um the game room is 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 no longer going to be part of the the whole Perfect. suite of services offered yeah Hi, valerie thank you so much rachel for putting this together um as a person also who's been at the library when uh, there are lots of kids running around <laughs> running through the library mm -hmm. um, and uh craziness just craziness. Uh, and my worry was always, um, what if children get hurt? Mm -hmm. What does the library do? Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I, I think 12 and younger is, is very reasonable. Um, my question, though, is um, you have here under library response first occurrence, it says give oral warning. Now, so if there are kids that show up that are nine years old on their own, you're giving the warning to the children or to the, how, how is this happening? How are you implementing this? So, so I think that at that point, we will probably try and get the, the child's um, contact information and, and contact the parent as well. So the verbally say, you know, you may not be aware of what the, what the policy is. This is the policy, give them a copy of it. Um, you know, it, I mean, the, I think that that our initial plan, because you know, we don't want to be punitive. We don't want to make people feel unwelcome. Is to just kind of have a conversation with the child and say, you know, so, you know, this, you really need to be here with a parent and and tell the the child if we can contact the parent, you know, we will. But hand the child a policy to give to the parent. If that child then shows up the next day, then we we're, we're moving more to a, I think a a, a different. Um, uh, you know, and I guess we have the written policy on the second occurrence. So it, that's a good point. We may, we may just sort of pull that together, but we just, I, I think the drafting of this sort of, um, uh, you know, what to do when, we sort of want to be gentle. We don't want to make kids feel like they're being banned or, or that they've done something wrong. We just, especially where it's going to be a change in what kids may have thought was okay. So I think just sort of easing them into the, the notion that this isn't a place to be on your own and you really need to be with a parent. Um, 
but we, just, we can work through that a little bit more. Yeah. yeah, I'm just curious how you're going to enforce it and and how are you going to communicate it to, um, to people? Because I think that's gonna be um, really important. I'm sure it'll be on your website and on the front door and- uh, Well, the schools um, and community services, we, we were going to have a coordinated um, sort of messaging so that, um, and in our meeting, we talked about this, that, you know, that, um, well, I guess it would be the new superintendent, hopefully we, we can coordinate with, but to send out by email to all, all parents, not only this is these are the policies, but these are the options available to you at community services, and this is what's going on at the middle school. So these are the, the here are, you know not just don't send your child to the library, but send you know here are these other options for you. So we were going to try and have a, a cohesive response where we're also helping to promote what what community services and the school does have to offer, um, while also laying out the the guidelines for what's what's appropriate at the library so um and just trying to do it as much as possible and in as many ways you know courier newsletter website signage you know all all the ways <laughs> but i think communicating through the schools will be crucial um to to reaching everybody and 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 um also middle school parents association um, also, the Pond Cove um, for for the elementary school students who who do tend to come over as well. So yeah, definitely lots of different places to communicate it. Okay, great. Um, I'm keeping an eye on the clock. And know that we've got another issue that's probably going to have a fair amount of discussion. Is there anybody else that has anything that they want to weigh in with on this? So the next action would be to have this on our meeting on Monday um, to vote to approve the policy changes. Is that right? Unless it's instructed otherwise, Mr. Chairman, that will be our yep. plan. Okay. All right. Well, I think this has been a really valuable discussion, both for the immediate changes that are on tap as a result of your policy recommendations, but also I think opening up the broader conversation, um, you know, about this clear need that that hopefully we can continue that as part of future discussions around, um, you know, how to, how to provide for that audience. So. And I would for, oh, definitely. Ahead, oh. Sorry, Rachel. Go ahead, oh, Penny, no, I, did you have a question? I, I just wanted to um, make a point that as we implement these policy changes, don't we need to simultaneously address the, uh, the bubble that's going to come out of the uh, library? So we need to we, we need to address the problem, nope. the challenge, at the same time we implement policy, don't, don't we? Okay. And that's that's where we'll uh, you know we'll I took pretty good notes uh, during the conversation as well to reach out to community services, you know, looking at different options as well to to try to shape something because as this will be going into effect, uh, Rachel, correct me if I'm wrong, but looking at the start of the school year in September. Yeah. Well, okay. yeah, I think it, it would go into effect, um, you know, once once the council approves the policies, but that will be summer. So so I think the full impact of this isn't going to be felt really until fall. Um, I, mean, I understand the gist again. of what I understand the gist of what you're saying. I I, I don't want to hold the policy changes until oh, we I don't have either. some other alternative I program. What I what I think we can do is what Rachel alluded to and Matt of re-emphasizing what's there that folks just might not be aware of. And, you know, as Gretchen indicated and others have too, you know, obviously there's a natural sort of aging out of the aftercare program, but there are still some other things that are currently available mm -hmm. that maybe just aren't receiving enough attention, right. both either at community services or at the schools. And I think I think if, if there isn't some other defined place that replaces the library, we could at the very least allude to and communicating to these audiences that the town is looking at trying to find some alternative location, okay. you know, Perfect. and and stay tuned for more details on that. But I don't Perfect. think I don't think we should wait until everything's ticked and tied on that before, you know, moving forward with these. So I agree. I just don't like to be reactive in what yep. you described is fine. Okay. Yep. Okay. And I was just going to say I I would yep. I'm very interested in um, being part of whatever community solution happens in in terms of helping um that process to move forward so um and i'm sure that megan is as well 
at the library. So, Jeremy, did you have a comment you wanted to jump in on? Yeah, no, I get my only comment on that, um, just recalling when my kids were, you know, that age um, is, uh, Matt, it may be worth coordinating with uh, middle school in particular too around you know, some of the after school options that they offer and appropriate busing. I know one of the challenges that we had when, when our kids were in that five, six bubble was that you know, there was sort of variable timing on some of the after school activities mm -hmm. that were offered at the middle school. And so it wasn't always apparent that the kids were going to be able to make the late bus. And then, you know, the library sort of became the, okay, well, I've got 15 minutes or whatever it is until dad can get here, you know, kind of a place. And so just making sure that, that the middle school has the right transportation options in place um, around some of their activities so that they're not also sort of adding to the need for those or, or that or that kids can you know go to community services if that's the more, more appropriate place to mm -hmm. go and wait for those to, you know whatever that solution is but I think that transportation piece is also sometimes a piece a part of it yeah, definitely so and oftentimes you know it's, it's the shoulder season between uh, athletic seasons is when you see it you'll see a spike in traffic as well you know basketball will end and then it's you know, six weeks until lacrosse track or baseball softball uh so you, you've got that and then in the fall the end of soccer field hockey and uh different sports then cross country until basketball starts or the swimming or what have you hits so um there's that that time where you find more uh, acute usage as well so uh, yeah i think those are i mean there's a lot of great points here to work with to try to have that available during those windows as well as regular times for those kids who just don't do those programs and uh, I want to find something else that they can engage in. Yeah, I remember those days a lot. <laughs> Just fifth and sixth grade was a, was a challenge. <laughs> Valerie, did you have another thing you wanted to comment on? Was your hand just up? Okay. Um, Rachel, were you, did, did you get all your points yep. wrapped up? Yep, I'm okay. all good. Great. Well, um, right. thank you very much to you and again to the committee. Appreciate it, Tim. Jason, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. Stay cool. Thanks. Um, so the next item is number three on the agenda, which is the shortcut roads. Um, so um, I want to thank, uh, thank Mr. Ree uh, for his comment earlier as we revisit this issue. And um, Jeremy, I know this was originally something that somebody reached out to you about. Um, Matt, I know that you've provided through uh, some things from Maureen, some of the history on this. So um, I guess I'll turn it over to the both of you if you want to sort of tee things up and provide some context here. Sure. Uh, I'd be happy to, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I can get the ball rolling. Back uh, oh, in 2006, there was, a, a, well, at, at initially there was a subdivision that was planned that was linking through, uh, I think it was the, the Cottage Brook subdivision that was was going to be established during that time period. The uh, the thought of connecting through uh, I want to say the Columbus neighborhood uh, through onto uh, Astor Lane. Uh, there was some concern of high traffic that was going to take place there, and there was a citizen uh, led initiative that ultimately came in uh, with the uh, with language that uh, did not. Well, wanted to be, uh, I guess, forbidding shortcut roads or the ability for roads to be used as shortcuts to go from one area of town to the other. So they came forward with that provision. Uh, the result of which was the uh, a gate that was put up at the uh, on Astor Lane or now is Chicory Chicory Way. That uh, you did have the connectivity that was there, but uh, and that was part of their original approval. Uh, but yet that then the gate was installed that was going to stop that. Um, since that point in time, uh, Maxwell Woods has come along, and uh, one and and originally there was concern because there was only one outlet on each end, uh, and that's why the, they didn't want to have that connectivity take place. But now there are two exits that would come out there. There's the Maxwell Woods end of Astor Lane, and the Cottage Brook or the uh, South Street Astor Lane end on the other uh, part of of, uh, of off from Spurwink. Uh, so that connectivity. Uh, you know, became more of an issue for some of the residents who live in there as well. The concern would be 
relating to public safety for one, uh, if someone was in need of uh, EMS services and if it was more efficient to come through there and not have to navigate either through the gate or have to navigate around to different portions of the community to then come at, to enter and access the property. Uh, it makes sense to have a discussion what's gonna provide the highest level of, of public safety uh, pro provi provision of services. So uh, there's that side of it. Uh, but then also there, you know, there are other issues that have, have evolved. And uh, I know uh, new residents of the, of the Maxwell Woods, uh, some of the condominiums association, Mr. Mr. Ed Ray was one of, uh, as we spoke earlier this evening, uh, as well as Paul McKinney had reached out to Jeremy, uh, Councilor Gabrielson and spoke with him about his concerns for it as well. So uh, as, as the landscape have changed and, and people have had the opportunity to reconsider that, I think uh, the request has been brought back to the council to say, you know, what, uh, is this something that the count, you know, af after years of experiencing this, is this something that we may want to reconsider as a decision? Jeremy, was there anything you wanted to add from? Yeah, no, I think that was a great summary. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, I think also just, to, to build slightly on what Matt was saying, you know, not only is there years of experiencing it, but we, we know what the equation looks like on both sides of this gate now, and there's people living on both sides of it. I think, you know, when, when it went up, uh, there were people living on one side of it who, who didn't necessarily know what was going to be coming their direction. Um, now, some of those people may have an interest in going driving through this neighborhood on occasion to visit friends and neighbors who don't live that far away from them and, and vice versa. Um, it just seems like this would uh, contribute to that sort of neighborhood connectivity in this part of town. Um, I, and so yeah, I thanks, um, Jamie, for, for making room on the agenda to, to talk about this. I, I think, in my mind, one of the, the questions that I am, you know, kind of most curious about is just thinking about the fact that this was brought forward as a, as a referendum is, you know, what is, what is the appropriate next step um, if we want to, if we want to look at this, um, how should we go about thinking of thinking through as a council, you know, what the right, right solution might be. And, and then also, you know, what's the, what's the decision-making process? Is this a, a council decision or is this uh, something that we go back, you know, to the, to the voters who originally enacted it? Matt, do you have an answer on that or? Well, yeah, the, the council is the ordinance making authority for the community. And if you wanted to, uh, if you, you know, so chose to amend or, or, or even repeal an ordinance, uh, you do have that authority uh, and you could go forward with that action after, you know, after taking the appropriate steps that would be going through, uh, well, you're extremely familiar with the <laughs> ordinance amendment process at this point in time. So I would do and follow those same, those same steps. Okay, um, Penny. I just have a general question that if we if we delve into this um, um, uh, kind of connectivity, will this open up the conversation down in um, uh, Broad Cove again? Well, that's a, I mean that's a great question. I mean that's that's something that the council has. I mean on occasion open that at times, uh, you still have the ability to say, uh, I think you still would have the ability to say that that should remain uh, as, it, as it currently is constructed. Uh, in this situation, for instance, the roads brought up to town, town standards, uh, you have accepted it. Uh, there would be some substantial, uh, looking at Jordan Farm Road, at least the connection from the end in, uh, in, uh, in Broad Cove and the other end of Jordan Farm Road. Uh, it would take a significant amount of uh, investment to bring that up to town standards. So it's kind of one's an apple and one's an orange uh, okay. as far as the road, uh, road construction goes at this point in time. Okay. Are there other, are uh, there other uh, places where that might bubble up? The other one uh, that has now has a chain going across it is over on uh, South Street, but that's a private road section at that point. So okay. that uh, so that wouldn't be applicable here. So the one okay. uh, the only uh, one that we do have that on where it's on a town accepted road is uh, is the 
uh, segment from, and I, I misspoke earlier, it's not Columbus, it's the Columbus Road neighborhood, but it's Kildeer, and then as that connects into uh, Astor or Chicory Way, I think it's also called. Mm -hmm. And at the time it was uh, the fire chief's recommendation to not do it. He was very concerned about it from a public safety standpoint uh, from providing EMS services. Uh, what are other folks thoughts on, I think the, I would like to hear other folks thoughts on the point that Jeremy brought up around, well, Matt's correct in that ultimately we're the ones that, um, you know, set and approve or repeal ordinances or things like that. It, it's fairly unusual for something to come to the point where it's adopted as part of a citizen initiated referendum, which is not to say that just everything that gathers enough signatures is and gets on as a citizen initiated referendum uh, is somehow more important or not than something that the council endeavors on its own, but um, it certainly carries with it a different um, uh, political pressure, I guess, than, um, than other things. So. I'm particularly interested to hear folks' thoughts on that, on, on sort of how we figure out the way forward if, if we're to take any action on this. Go ahead, Valerie. Well, it, it seems to me that um, we could have a, um, a public hearing on it and then send it to the ordinance committee. So if you really thought that um, people wanted to weigh in, we could have a public hearing or send it to the ordinance committee like we did with short-term rentals and then have a, a public hearing. Jeremy? Um, yeah, and so, I mean, clearly as, if we send it to the ordinance committee when it comes back, there would be a public hearing as part of that adoption process. Um, I, I, and I, and I think that's good. Um, I, I think my, I, I sort of raised the question earlier without expressing an opinion one way or the other, but um, my general thought is that I, I think um, that if the council were to refer this to the ordinance committee, the committee could come up with a relatively narrowly tailored amendment that would address the, the, the issue at, at um, Chicory Lane without necessarily opening up the, the broad cove discussion um, or would apply to one without applying to the other. Um, and I think we would receive significant public input as part of that process in ordinance committee as well as at the public hearing. Um, but I, I do think, I, I wonder if, um, or I guess my thought would be that it might be worth making it part of the, charge to the ordinance committee to consider whether the amendment should be presented as a referendum um, and, and sort of taking some of that input from the public as part of the ordinance development process so that when the ordinance committee reports back, that's also something that the ordinance committee is reporting on. Uh, and that's just a suggestion. I'm, I'm just curious, ahead, for a referendum, don't we have to have signatures, Matt? I think the town could actually place that as a question if you so chose. I, I can uh, I can work into just double checking that with legal, but uh, I, I think the council could could place that on as a question if you did want to go go that route. Um, but I, I may have to come back and respond to you by email or bring that back on Monday as a, as a follow up. I think you're I think you are correct, Matt. I mean it. it well. Well, vastly different. I mean, it's no different than anything else we vote on for a, for a warrant, right? For a, a, the election warrant. True. I may be able to get it in a couple of minutes here at the charter. So, go ahead, Penny. While Matt's doing that, um, I just have to say that I'm feeling a bit uncomfortable with this, and and I'm feeling uncomfortable for a couple of different reasons. Number one, there is a lot of, and, and I'd really like to see it before we determine what direction we want to go. There is a lot 
of uh, uh, narrative around this from a, um, a planning board perspective. Uh, there's been so much uh, talked about when um, Maxwell Woods was being um, developed. I mean, I not that I just spend my time at uh, planning board meetings, but this one's one that was interesting to me. Um, there was a lot of, um, I would say, uh, concern about being able to drive through, uh, to have that kind of pass through. There were a lot of people opposed to allowing traffic to go, come in one way and go out another. There's a lot that has been said out there, and um, I'd like to, I'd like to see that, um, or I would like to be hearing from more people before we say send this on to the ordinance committee. I also have a really a real concern that when we've had a a, a referendum and a decision made, um, it's. It's like when at the state level, when we have a, a referendum and people have said, this is what we want to have happen and it gets overturned, it's a lot of angst around that. Um, it's saying that I have no voice. My, uh, we voted and we said that this is what we wanted to have happen. And now you can take and overturn that. Um, I, those are my two biggest concerns. I really think the citizens spoke and uh, yes, times do change, but it hasn't been that, I, I don't know, it hasn't been that long. Um, and I think we have a lot of history in uh, what was said as Mac, as well, Woods was being built and it kind of reiterated that, um, that vote. Um, and so um, I, those are my concerns. Penny, I, I agree with you. I, I, you know, as you all probably sensed in the way I posed the question, I, I'm looking to, you know, tread rather carefully here. Um, and the the only thing I would, I, and I, I completely agree with the, the the sort of parallel example you gave um, of what happens in Augusta. Um, I think the the slight difference I would draw in this case is that I mean it has been 15 years. Um, a lot of times the things that <clears throat> we see in Augusta tends to be on something that was just enacted, right? So it's a, a little closer proximity time-wise. And then I think the conditions on the ground have changed materially, you know, and, and I think you're right that there was some discussion of this during the planning for the Maxwell Woods development. Um, I, I probably am not as familiar with some of the, you know, minutia and details on that that I should be. And so I would want to get better familiarized with the more recent body of discussion and 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 debate um, that centered around that. Because I the first question that came to my mind on this was, well, what, when Maxwell Woods was open or was developed, why wasn't this open then? Like what it, it would have seemed to have made sense. And so I would I would personally want to go back and revisit some of that um, body of work to see you know what were some of the discussions held at that point because it seems it seems odd to me that that would have been the natural time to do it and so why wasn't that factored in and maybe others know and can tell me but um so but i'm i'm particularly mindful of sort of overturning the specific um direction from a referendum vote and um I'm not. I'm not opposed to doing it if it warrants it, but I. I. I'm, I, I think it's something we need to move carefully on. So, go ahead, so, Penny. To your point, Jamie, um, uh, the fact that you know you're not a, as well versed in uh, what was the uh, discussion during Maxwell Woods development. Um, I think we need to hear that. I think we need to see it. Somebody's got to, I mean, I can tell you Penny's filtered view of what I heard, but I'd rather have people uh, hear from either Maureen or see the, uh, uh, all of the 
correspondence that went to the planning board or somehow. And, um, and I think Valerie's example of, let's get this out there and let's get some, some input before we, we move. Um, and uh, so I need to, I think we all need to understand why it didn't happen during a Maxwell Woods development. I heard there were a lot of people opposed a lot. And one of the barriers that uh, as that project was moving along was this uh, uh, gate and having an, um, an egress onto what was it, it's from a cabinet or whatever. Uh, there was a lot of concern around this whole thing. So. Um, I'm going to go to Gretchen and then I see that Ed's got his hand raised again. I'm interested to hear um, since we're you know, more actively talking about it. I, I do want to hear what he has to say too. So um, Gretchen, go ahead and then um, we'll grab the comment from Ed. Okay, thanks, Jamie. Yeah, I'm just, I'll admit to just feeling a little too in the dark right now to formulate an opinion on this. I would say that in general, I am, uh, feel really sensitive or even reticent, I would say, to changing something that was voted in by our town citizens. I think that that's a, a, a fairly large, I mean, that's a kind of a big thing to take on. So I would be really cautious there. But I, again, I, I don't feel like I even have enough background information to to make the determination of whether we should consider that. So I would, I'm more than happy to do my homework, but I at least need someone to point us or me to where we can get some of this information because all I know about this is what I had in front of me for tonight's meeting, um, which definitely was not enough to, to, to figure this out. So more information. <laughs> um, Matt, can you open up uh, Mr. Ray's mic again? Here you go, sir. Go ahead, Ed. Um, first of all, let me let me tell you, I didn't move into this area until um, our unit in in uh, Cottage Brooks Condo Association was open. We bought it in 2019, so I'm a newcomer. Um, was formerly in Portland, but let me set, tell you, in 2006, um, Maxwell Woodens and and Cottage Brook. They may have been on on the far horizon, but they certainly there wasn't any construction. There wasn't anything going on. So, I believe that the the um, uh, egress there, which probably was required by law, they usually need two ways of uh, getting in and out of a development, even if one way is gated. Um, was because of the the cottage brook the. There was a, a, a development there, but it wasn't the condo association. Okay, so Astor Lane ended just past where this uh, shortcut uh, went through. So there was a real concern, I'm sure, at that point that you know if people had two ways, only two ways of getting out, you know, that might generate a lot of traffic. Things have changed quite a bit since then. The um, it was in 2019 that the last of the um, Cottage Brook Condo Association um, houses were completed. Um, and it was just last year that Astor Lane was finally opened all the way to, um, to Spurwink. Um, it hadn't been open uh, before. And the Maxwell Woods development is a separate development, although adjacent to the, the um, uh, Cottage Brook uh, condo. Uh, development. So there, there are three separate pieces, but things have changed radically on the ground since 2006. Uh, whether that makes any difference to people who are concerned about the traffic, I don't know. But I just tell you that things have changed dramatically, um, and that uh, you know there there are easier ways than going through the adjacent neighborhood to get any place uh, just by going along Astor Lane to Spurwick. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Penny, go ahead. I just want to say that, oh, because I'm Google Earthing right now. Um, I just want to say it would be really good to have up on the screen that when we're having this conversation and we're gathering more data about it, to have the uh, um, 
Google Earth view of the world there so that we can track the roads and know exactly what we're talking about, what it may have looked like in 2006, what it looks like now. Uh, because then we can really, because I'm with Gretchen, I, I want to make an informed decision. I mean, I can go, oh yeah, let's send it to ordinance, but um, I don't, I, I don't feel comfortable with that. I, I really need to understand. Um, so I'll just. Hey Matt, um, could we, what, what I would recommend doing is we have a, another workshop meeting on this uh, in July and we invite uh, Maureen and anybody, um, I don't know if there's anybody um, from the planning board that was involved in Cottage Brook and Maxwell Woods. Um, looking at the minutes of the 2006 meeting, I find it ironic that there's a current planning board member who was a counselor in 2006. Uh, so probably has some very good historic knowledge in uh, Marianne Lynch, um, who might be worth inviting to a discussion. Um, and any other, um, I don't know, I, I, I know there's neighborhood associations in both of these groups of Maxwell Woods and Cottage Brook, I believe. I don't know if they have a president of each of their neighborhood associations that could be invited to come and just um, um, have more of a roundtable discussion, um, get the pertinent um, history and, and, and view of how things were in 06 and some of the decisions that were made between now between then and today. And then, um, as Penny just alluded to, have, have maybe a more visual look at, at everything. And um, maybe that will help us to um, you know, have a better frame up the, the issue and then figure out what the best way um, to move forward is. So if, if it would be helpful, Mr. Chairman, I have yeah. my screen uh, share ready. If I could uh, show you just a quick map of what uh, hopefully you're looking at. Uh, GPS map of uh, Astor Lane. Uh, the subject that we're looking at is this right here. And you can see that line right there, faint line, that's the gate. That's about as close, like this, this is from 2017. So here comes Kildare Road and here's Columbus coming in. And then you come up here and that's where the gate is. And this is uh, Chicory Lane at this point. I think that's what that's called. There's Astor and that comes through and then if I back out some, uh, this now goes all the way through and connects here onto Spurwink at that section. This is all constructed now uh, with these yellow boxes being, you know, when we update our aerials, those will show buildings in those footprints now. And then here's the other end where Aster comes through, navigates around through here, through the old, uh, uh, older neighborhood initially. And then here's, this is South Street here but then it comes through and comes back on the spur link there. So originally- And the road, the larger road running north to south there, your cursor was just over it a second ago on the right hand side, that's Mitchell? This is a spur link. Spur no, 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 on the, on the right side of the map. And yeah, this is right there. Here. So yeah, yeah okay. the concern at the time was that folks would want to come along Mitchell, cut through Columbus, uh, the Columbus Road neighborhood, and then cut down through here, and then you know zoom through this neighborhood to get out over here at this at the stop sign at Square Rink uh, Avenue uh, as the cut through. Uh, but you know some of that pressure, uh, you know, now the thought would be okay. Well, the, you know the, the potential that there was going to be a cut through it might come through here, but ultimately it, it you know it might not be as much of an that much of an impediment or something that folks would use. So. Um, that's the million dollar question when it when it comes to it but that's that's pretty much what we're looking at here um versus uh yeah and i can show you and if you have another quick second um one other section town where, where councillor jordan was asking about with uh jordan farm road and that's a uh that is a horse of a different color uh there let's see road. sorry you need to get a little further down um, to Broad Cove. So now uh, this is what we're talking about here with Jordan Farm. And that's where the road ends here in, uh, in Broad Cove. And then this is all gravel here. And then, and then it takes up again here with the, the more refined road there. So 
that's what kind of why I would say that they're more apples, apples and oranges uh, in comparing the in comparing the two. But I, I agree with you. I think it's probably best to to have this on an additional future workshop, and then we can uh, bring in multiple different sources to have a, a more advanced discussion as well, and then decide if you want to think about amending that or uh, or at least with a little bit more information you can have firmer footing to from which to make a decision on. Go ahead, Jeremy. Um, thank, I think that's a, a very sensible way to move forward. Um, and I, I, Matt, if uh, I, I don't know if this is a question for Maureen or not, but I think one of the other pieces of information, I know a lot of the concern that was expressed around this previously had to do with traffic volume. Um, and um, I'm, I'm looking on DOT's website now, uh, you know, the, the daily traffic volume on Spurwink is like a thousand and on Mitchell is like 1600. So they're not, you know, super, super high traffic volume roads, but um, the, they don't have any data on, on Astor Lane in their public viewer. So if there's any information that we have on just sort of like, what's the level, what's the, what's the approximate level of traffic volume in these neighborhoods now? And how does that compare with, I mean, everybody on Spurwink is not going to turn and cut through, you know, and everybody on, um, but, you know, how, like, I, I know that that probably involves, you know, a more detailed traffic analysis, but just in sort of gross numbers, like, what's the range we're looking at here? If I may, Mr. Chairman, uh, the cool thing with both Cottage Brook and Maxwell Woods is that they both had traffic estimates during their <laughs> approval process. So that may be some of the information that can be gleaned from their uh, from their whole planning board packets to to see what they you know based on the number of houses, the average daily uh, average daily daily average annual daily traffic uh, type of things based on the sorry I was tongue tied there uh, based on the. The number of homes that were going in and what that what they forecast for that and you know if such a thing did need to go forward as well we could always get a get a quick car count done as well so and get a quick study on that done. Any other comments? Uh, real quick, Ed, will as we wrap this up. Matt, I'll open up your mic again. There you go. Go ahead. I was just going to say that the uh, College Brook Association has a, pre or so not association, it's a condo association, has a president, Paul McKinney, um, whom some of you may know. Um, the vice president is uh, Peter Curry, um, who some of you may also know. So um, you're free, free to- Gotta love a small and, town. <laughs> uh, Maxwell Woods Condo Association um, it hasn't been turned over by the developer yet. So um, presumably that'll happen in the next few months, but uh, they have a, a, a president waiting to take over, but they don't, they're not formally established yet. And I don't know about yeah, the, I mean, the older neighborhood, whether it has an association or not. Thank you. Yeah, even if it's just somebody with sort of an appointed representative, you know, uh, you know, mayor of the neighborhood kind of person, you know, that. Well, we can be helpful just to, we yeah. can certainly identify who the uh, designated uh, uh, president is. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, sure. and appreciate your input um, this evening. So, um, okay. If nobody else has anything else on that, I think we're ready to move off of that agenda item. Yes. Okay. Um, next up is. Um, the Gould Award. So I don't think we did an award last year, right, Matt, because of COVID? I, last one I remembered was the one we gave to the um, Thompsons. Yes. Yep, that's correct. No, no so, we did give an oh, award last year to oh, Bob Malley. Bob Malley, yeah. Oh, right, right, right. You're right. You're right. Thank you for reminding me. It is I forgot. Yeah, I'm pulling the, it was a Zoom. The Zoom. Uh, that's right. He was up at camp, <laughs> and Becky was at home. That's right. Now, now I remember. Okay. Um, so, um, Nicole and Gretchen, are you guys familiar with the Gould Award? Do you know what it is? 
just what I read in the packet. So, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, one of the, you know, highest honors granted to a Cape citizen um, in memory of Ralph Gould, um, basically 